My name is uh, Agnieszka Szufarska, uh, and uh, I am here today to tell you a bit about the future of communications. I work in Nokia Bell Labs. I will show zero lines of code, uh, but still you can learn about uh, where communications is heading, how networking will look like in 10 years from now, uh, what this digital fabric uh, of our lives would be and how we can uh, benefit from it. You probably are programmers. I have been doing some programming in my life. I was never good at it, honestly. Uh, but I have very, very high esteem and respect for uh, programmers, software developers. I lead a team of people who uh, are very, very good uh, software developers, and I know what it takes uh, to uh, write good code. So I think that what you will learn from this session is what applications you would see in the future, what your code can be doing in 10 years from now, and uh, uh, what tasks, what services you would be delivering with uh, your excellent work. I uh, have been working in research for 10 years now. Uh, I lead a research team in Nokia Bell Labs, and what we do is we try to uh, solve big problems of humanity 10 years ahead. So, uh, for example, we think about new services that we will see in the future. We are thinking uh, what new mechanisms in networking would be needed for those. So how would scheduling over a wireless radio link uh, be done? What should uh, edge cloud be built uh, like? So uh, all those things is what we are uh, working on. And uh, in wider Bell Labs team, I was, uh, I was not part of it. We have uh, actually even written a book. The book is called The Future X Network. And The Future X Network book is something uh, that contains our holistic vision 10 years ahead about the future of communications. So I will speak to you for one and a half hour. Okay, actually less, because we are a tiny bit uh, over time. But if you read the book, you will uh, know all of it. And actually, you can win the book at the end of my talk, because I have uh, uh, one of those for you. It's normally available on Amazon, but, uh, but I have one copy for you. So the claim that I am making in my speech is that we are now experiencing a revolution in communications. We are now experiencing a drastic big change. And how do you typically define a revolution. We have had multiple revolutions uh, over the past uh, few hundreds of years. And uh, uh, one example, of course, is our industrial revolutions that we have seen in the past. Uh, the first, the second, the one where we had the steam engines uh, uh, improving the manufacturing efficiency. Then we had communications and the phone and the telegraph and, and uh, all that. So. How we characterize a revolution is that before it, uh, people could not easily anticipate how life would look like after the revolution. So before the invention of steam engine, people would not really do well uh, inventing uh, the world after it. So thinking what their lives would look like after the invention of steam engine. This is the plan for my speech. And these are the revolutions. So uh, I have just given you an example of this one, the first industrial revolution, but we actually have many of, many of those. So one uh, revolution that uh, I can uh, talk to you in a relatively competent way is the one that I have lived through, uh, which is this one. Uh, I have lived through it, and uh, when I was a small kid, it was... Uh, unthinkable for me that if I was walking on a street somewhere, I could access any piece of information I wanted. I could check a recipe, I could check something that I would typically look for in an encyclopedia, and not Wikipedia, because there was no Wikipedia, just uh, this kind of big book. Yeah. So first, I got my first Commodore C64. I was sharing it with my brothers, and the fights were fierce. Uh, but then the uh, World Wide Web came. So at that time, it was really very, very exciting for me to 
experience a connection or a chat with a person who is in a completely other place. It was unthinkable for me that this is actually possible. But then uh, more unthinkable things came. So right now, the mobile phones are everything for us. We, do, we use them for tracking our sports activities. We use them to access any pieces of information. Okay, we call sometimes, but we typically use them uh, as the hubs for our lives. And we will uh, do more and more of that with the automation of everything. Because what is uh, ahead of us is uh, the really uh, adding communications uh, capabilities, digitalization and communication to basically everything that uh, can benefit from connectivity. This is the Internet of Things, and this is actually a big part of what I will talk about today. <laughs> the timeline reaches 2020, but it starts in 1990. So first, okay, we had internet, we had connectivity, we could uh, see remote content, but we typically had to know the content that we want to access. So we uh, had to know the URL that we wanted to get to. But then the search capabilities that Google has um, uh, been one of the uh, search engines, but is the most successful one right now and has built a whole ecosystem on top of it. This has been a big game changer for the uh, uh, connectivity. So the next phase that you see here is the sharing of media. OK, maybe not always legally. But already in the next phase, the legal sharing of media came. So the uh, development of technology is always boosting the number of data being sent. Yeah? So together with uh, the commercial media sharing, also the sharing of personal data came. Yeah? So we can see here some of the services. I uh, use some of them, maybe not all of them. And then uh, even more are emerging right now. So if this trend would continue, we would uh, end up somewhere here. We would switch from 4K video to 8K uh, video. We uh, can have uh, user-generated content hosted in the cloud. But actually, we see that something more is happening because we foresee that we would get here. This is how uh, um, this is going to happen. Uh, we will have connectivity added to all the objects that can benefit from connectivity. I have already told that. Yeah? So uh, some of them will be just sending small bursts of data every now and then reporting like meters for uh, water, energy or gas. But some of them can be massive amounts of uh, data, like, uh, for example, cameras. Yeah? So this is where we now foresee where we will get with communications. And uh, this uh, whole trend, this development, was not possible to be foreseen uh, in the uh, earlier times. Yeah? We, we actually have uh, one example of person who was able to predict a lot of future technology uh, before the revolutions, but this was a, um, a science fiction writer, right? You know who I mean. This was Stanisław Lem. Okay, so my claim is that the future is uh, very much different from the past. This is what we uh, experience when we are uh, headed towards a revolution or in the middle of it. I will highlight just a few items uh, on this list. So first, in the past, maybe a bit now, uh, typically innovations uh, are done by one big company. Yeah? The company has research team, the company uh, has uh, R&D, then development and develops products and proposes them to the market. Uh, we can uh, benefit much more if we are co-designing uh, the uh, um, Mm, if we are co-designing the innovations. The next uh, thing that I have here is the innovation speed. The innovation speed can be much, much faster if we, uh, if we uh, move 
in this partnership or platform based way. This is successful with the Android market, this is successful with the iOS, and this is also how many industries want to succeed. They want to succeed by providing platform, open APIs, and uh, asking really creative people and smaller companies to contribute to the success of their business. And then we will be moving from heavily centralized architecture uh, towards massively distributed architecture. We want this in order to uh, achieve much higher data rates, but also this part here, this one millisecond latency. Okay, maybe not one millisecond, but why do we uh, low latency in our networks? And this is one example. And this is actually just one tiny example that I have picked because my husband plays this particular game. Uh, but there are many, many other games. Yeah? So there is Counter-Strike, uh, there is Battlefield, I think that uh, there is Blizzard Overwatch coming. So uh, a lot of uh, online games, especially uh, first-person shooter games, they uh, demand low latency, they uh, demand stable latency, so low jitter. So I would say that the values of latency needed for this particular game are not this low, are not this dramatic. So maybe this is uh, 30 milliseconds that you can play comfortably, maybe this is 20. But uh, as we move to also mobile uh, games, as we move to games that uh, involve virtual and augmented reality, we will see higher and higher requirements on the connectivity stability, on the bandwidth, on the low latency of the connection. Yeah? So this may not seem as too serious example, but actually this is uh, one that uh, I expect that we would understand, like all of us, at least I understand it. This is how we can uh, now classify latency, so delay in the networks. Some services are not delay or latency sensitive at all. Yeah? So they are here. If we are uh, browsing some web pages, if we are doing some streaming from YouTube maybe, we are not in trouble at all, even if our connection has some delays, right? But then, as I said, if we want to move to uh, gaming, then we already uh, are uh, after high bandwidth, low latency, depends, depending if the, if the game is hosted on our computer, if this is hosted in the, uh, in the cloud uh, server. I think cloud gaming is particularly uh, demanding if we don't have uh, any uh, game content installed on, uh, on, our, on our machine. The cloud-assisted driving is an interesting new use case that's coming up. So basically, what's happening is that we are having more and more uh, intelligence built into cars. So uh, my car already has uh, this uh, keeping the stable speed. If, uh, I am on a motorway. This is simple, but there are next, next and next steps coming for the connected cars. There are already autonomous cars uh, going around. Maybe sometimes they have uh, a tiny little accidents, but this is what always happens when a new technology is being developed. And what will also happen is that we will have uh, the coordination system for the cars. The cars will also have a built-in connectivity to communicate to the network and also to other cars around. Yeah? So it's not to replace sensors that the cars are relying on right now, it's rather to complement them because we want multiple redundant systems. So I have uh, here m more examples, but I think uh, I will save uh, time by not going in detail through all of them. Uh, we have some time constraints, so let's, uh, let's move forward. I think the one thing that I may wish to tell you about is this uh, seven milliseconds? This is a uh, vestibular ocular reflex. This is uh, this can also be referred to motion to photon latency. This is also related. Yeah, I think the reason why previous virtual reality wipes because we have seen a few of them. They failed. 
is uh, because people were getting nauseated, and they were getting nauseated. We are not talking here about uh, the uh, delay in the uh, in the communications. This is actually about the delay, uh, even in the equipment itself, right? And uh, the delay that we are talking about is between the movement of our head or body and uh, uh, when the image be 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 before our eyes is shifting to properly reflect where we have moved our body. So this delay has, um, is something that people are very sensitive to. So this is uh, on average 15 milliseconds, but this is 7 to 20. I think the studies have shown that. So if we want virtual and augmented reality to be successful, we should be able to deliver this uh, similar values of uh, uh, latency. And uh, if we are to deliver services locally, we basically should serve them from a close point to the uh, end user. You can see here, we have uh, the round trip time in the milliseconds, we have uh, the distance in kilometers uh, to the uh, uh, to the nearest server from which the content is being served. So if we are after a few milliseconds latency, we should have the uh, servers uh, between 100 and 1,000 uh, kilometers away. Yeah, so this is physics, yeah? this, this is the speed of light in the fiber. And this is actually also what uh, other global cloud providers have uh, realized. Netflix has uh, launched something uh, that is called Open Connect. And with the Open Connect, they are basically aiming not to serve their content just from those internet exchange points, so the, this uh, orange circles. They want to partner with the ISPs, so internet service providers worldwide, so that their content is streamed directly from the ISPs. They have uh, provided uh, interfaces, training, applications to be uh, loaded in the network and server of the ISPs. And the ISPs benefit from it in a way that they don't need to provide this huge capacity on the backlink to the rest of the network. And uh, this is actually how Netflix is able to launch content globally in multiple countries at the same time. Yeah, because uh, for such a big, big company, it's very difficult to launch uh, like a new s a series, uh, a new season of a, uh, of a popular series worldwide. So this is uh, where I also say that uh, this is already possible for the uh, global cloud uh, providers. This is what they have realized that th the Global, local is the new reality. We want to deliver service globally, but in order to deliver this service globally, to make it available globally, that everyone in the world gets the same service, we should be able to host it locally. Because if we host it globally, there is too much overload on the network. So this is where we see the uh, edge cloud in a completely other industry. So this is not a network, uh, mobile network communications. This is what I do. And the virtual reality. Now we are experiencing the new wave of it. We have uh, seen a few waves of VR also in the past, the bandwidth uh, for the virtual reality is higher, the latency is lower. So in this sense, the service uh, that can be delivered is very demanding. Yeah? And so I have already explained to you the motion to photon latency. And this is a big thing, because if we are able to combat this, if we are able to deliver good quality content with uh, these uh, low delays, then I think the, uh, the whole new industry that comes from a virtual and augmented reality will be successful. Yeah, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, honestly. Uh, I think that uh, one thing that is worth uh, mentioning is that uh, this 
bandwidth and uh, latency are actually exchangeable. And you will uh, hear uh, more of this if you attend the next uh, talk in this room. This will be a talk from my colleague Patrick Marsh. But I have just told you about uh, this emerging industry for virtual uh, and augmented reality, and uh, uh, I can actually show you a few examples. So first, multi-user interactive environments, including games, of course. Uh, so this uh, VR and uh, augmented uh, reality gaming is, uh, uh, I would say, a big thing. And uh, uh, the game that you ha see a screenshot uh, here is called uh, Werewolf Within. And uh, this game is actually, I, I'm not sure if this is launched already, I, ha I'm, I have not played it, but uh, this is a social game. So people are embodied by avatars in this game, but the avatars really mimic the movements uh, of people. And you can see them here, they are actually uh, arguing quite, quite fiercely, and uh, this is because the game is something similar to the Polish game of, of Mafia, where basically at night, somebody becomes an evil character and uh, attacks others and uh, during the day people are arguing is the is the bad guy right so this is something that was not possible over chat right you you need to see the uh, faces of people you need to see their gestures you need to hear their voice properly right so all that is possible in this avatar based game and where we want to get is we want to get into um, this uh, virtual presence game that people are not embodied by avatars, but instead they, uh, they are themselves in the game, right? Next, media and entertainment. This is the uh, videos. This is the virtual presence uh, or in other locations. Uh, the uh, item here, this, this ball, is an OZO camera. This is a camera developed by Nokia that is very expensive and is used for professional recording or virtual reality content. It has uh, cameras spaced similar as human eyes, it has uh, also microphones in an array around, and the content that is captured is really of very, very good quality. If you have seen the opening of the football championships, you could have seen also next to the, the DJ in the, in the middle of the stadium, it was there. Yeah? And then the teleoperation. So uh, the two previous parts were actually, well, entertainment, right? But we can make use of virtual and augmented reality also in the professional mm, areas of our lives. And uh, teleoperation is where basically we are remotely operating a machine. We are seeing what the machine is seeing. We uh, are experiencing uh, also the uh, tactile feedback, haptic feedback. Uh, of what the machine is uh, actually doing. And we can do this, this with mining, we can do this uh, deep uh, under the uh, water, or we can also do this in really hazardous uh, environments. So it actually makes life much safer for many people who typically had to go there, right? But we also would have use cases for augmented reality uh, uh, that uh, can help us in our professional lives. Yeah? So uh, a fire brigade that is entering a burning building would, I would say, benefit largely if they had a, an overlay of a building plan on their helmets, right? So the technology is there but we need to improve it. We need to make it work. We need to provide this low latency connectivity. I have already explained to you a bit about these upper use cases. These are the use cases uh, that uh, meant relatively high data rates. And then uh, the latency is on the uh, x-axis and you uh, see this uh, high, uh, higher latency, so not so demanding, and low latency here. So two areas that we have not touched are here and here. So this is the things like in the Internet of Things, yeah? so the sensors and uh, the digitally en enabled and connected objects, and then the system control. So this is where we are remotely steering uh, remote objects. This is also where we have the connected cars. 
I have changed the scales a bit. So in here, we have the data rate. And in here, instead of latency, we now have the number of users. And we have a few areas uh, deceptive in, uh, in the picture. So first, R1. So this is uh, a, a few megabits per second, maybe. Not too many users. This is the uh, area of communications that we uh, are in right now. Then the next one is what I have just told you about. This is the ultra broadband. This is virtual and augmented reality, but maybe, uh, maybe also uh, this even higher resolution streaming. Yeah. Then the R3. You can see that we really have multitude of of devices yeah so really lots and lots of devices in the uh, same area and this actually is a challenge for connectivity for the for the connected things and then the system control is also uh, what I told you about, where we need uh, lower latency. We need very high reliability because if we are remotely controlling a robot that is carrying a bomb, yeah, for example, we wouldn't like to have the connectivity uh, not too reliable. Yeah, we would rather prefer to have it perfect. And then there is also, uh, as you can see here, this is the formula for 5G. I have not uh, talked too much about 5G in this speech. This is actually a new thing for me because typically when I uh, deliver speeches, I usually talk mostly about 5G. So this is uh, a new thing for me. But 5G comprises of all those areas. Yeah. So future 5G connectivity, this is the success. Um, of LTE, but not just the successor. 5G will also incorporate the LTE. Yeah. So uh, 5G system will comprise out of uh, R1, R2, R3, R4, but what about R5? So R5, uh, surprisingly, is not allowed. And uh, those of you uh, who know about the uh, communications theory, know about the Shannon's uh, formula and law, and know that it's just not possible to serve within the same resources so many users with very, very high data rates. There is, again, in this speech, no magic, just physics. But I will focus now on these two areas, because these are the ones that I have not yet talked about. Uh, the things, uh, the uh, sensors, and also uh, the uh, system control. Uh, the, the example that I have uh, in here is first the smart city. And with the smart city, basically what we'll see is we will have all the things connected. Yeah. We will have uh, all the transportation connected. We will have drones flying uh, over the city for surveillance, maybe. We will have uh, the emergency services connected so that they precisely know what happened and where and when and how to get there because we will also have the precise information about the traffic in the, uh, in the city. Um, uh, also, we will have surveillance cameras, uh, the parking spots when I would be reaching the center of the city. I would have uh, the real-time information which parking spots uh, are uh, available and where I should not even start looking for a, for a parking spot. Yeah? So all that will make the cities more efficient, uh, nicer to live for people. Uh, but this is just an example. This is just uh, uh, the, the first thing where we can benefit. Then we can benefit from wearables. Those of you who are into sports, and not just eSports, uh, know that uh, you uh, can have uh, your smartwatch and smartphone track your uh, heart rate and uh, uh, blood pressure and number of steps and, and the route that you have taken while running or biking. So all that is nothing new, right? But we also have uh, sensors for people who have um, heart condition or at the risk of a heart attack or have diabetes. So the people who, whose health needs to be constantly monitored can have uh, their health sensors with them all the time. This is uh, also predictive healthcare uh, uh, theory, and there is a lot of developments in this area right now. So if you are thinking about 
like future areas where to put your creativity to or thinking about starting your own companies or programming something really fun. The uh, connected health or predictive healthcare is maybe a good place to uh, devote your talent to. But then we can have the same on the farm. Yeah. So if we have uh, a big farm, a farmer, okay, maybe he doesn't have a wife, and uh, then we uh, want to uh, have all the information for him available whenever he needs it. Yeah? He, he can have information from humidity sensors in his fields. He can have information about the well-being of livestock that he uh, has. He can have information about the uh, technical state of the machines that he has in, uh, in his farm. And uh, all that can be coupled with information available on the internet, like prices of goods that he is producing, or weather forecast, and all this information may be actually a huge pile of data. So maybe it's not so easy for him to manage all this data. That's why we need, on top of the information from the sensors, we also need intelligence that analyzes all this data and it digs out the parts that are really relevant for a particular person. Factories. Yeah? So I have told you about an example of a farmer, but for factories the scale is even larger. We can uh, manage the stocks of uh, components for manufacturing. We can manage the stocks of ready-made products. We can synchronize the machines in a production line between themselves so that the input of the next production machine in a line is exactly matched to the output of a previous one. We can monitor the state of those, uh, of those machines. We can constantly uh, ha know what's, what's happening and what's the status. So this is... Uh, um, right now called Industry 4.0. I think Germany is uh, very serious about it and there are many projects running. Okay, drones and robots. I think I, I will uh, speak about them in, in one go. We can uh, launch drones if we, if we want to provide connectivity in case of a disaster maybe. We can use them to monitor uh, the uh, surroundings, if something's happening, we can also deliver packages. I'm pretty sure you heard about the attempts that Amazon was making in the US to deliver uh, your order from Amazon within the uh, few hours uh, from the nearest center. Yeah? I think that there are still some legal issues to be sorted out, but hopefully this will be sorted out because I don't think there are too many reasons uh, uh, to keep this work away from the machines. So, in order to explain to you why we are doing this, I need to make a step back, and actually it's a big step back, because what you see here is the Maslow hierarchy of needs. So this is a big step back. Uh, the, the theory behind Maslow hierarchy of needs is that basically people cannot fulfill their higher order needs before uh, their lower order needs are fulfilled. Yeah? So, to put this bluntly, people will not care about the beauty if they don't feel secure, if they are hungry, or if they are sleep-deprived. Yeah? And basically this goes for all, all the bars in this triangle. So this uh, is the analog needs, and by the way, some people also complement the triangle by adding free Wi-Fi uh, on the, uh, the bottom of the pyramid. I have not done that. But now, what can we do with the Internet of Things? What we can do is we can actually create time. And we create time by, by automating some of the more mundane tasks from the lower parts of the pyramid. We use this with trust because we have proper mechanisms in place. And this is how we do it. First, we need to have all the things that we want to access digitally enabled. Yeah? So they basically should be gathering the data. They, have, they should have sensors. Then uh, we have them connected. Yeah? So the, the sensors, the things are transmitting information and data. Then we are storing the data. But uh, as I told you before, what we end up with, once we do it, is we end up with these huge piles of data. 
that my water meter is constantly increasing by the same uh, an, uh, amount, roughly, on average, right? That the temperature has not changed uh, in a factory for past two weeks, yeah, whatever. So some of this data is completely irrelevant, and what we need to do is uh, we need to process it. We need to uh, have uh, the event analysis, we need to dig out the important parts of the data, and then What's more, we also need to recognize uh, which of the events that we have spotted are relevant for which users, in which circumstances. Yeah? We should also be able to merge events from different clusters of data to create knowledge that is relevant for a particular person. Yeah? So with all that, we can actually really um, limit some of the time that we spend in the lower uh, bars of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, triangle here yeah so okay i can uh, have my coffee uh, ready for me in the morning uh, i can uh, have uh, the security of my house ensured also uh, with the uh, array of sensors and uh, i actually we could we could go on with more examples so just to recap what we want to do with the Internet of Things is we want to first connect people and things. Then we want to accumulate the data. But as I said, this does not solve anything just yet. Then we need to understand the data and create knowledge out of them. And then finally, use this knowledge just for ourselves. But we can also use it to steer other objects, yeah? So we can uh, use the data that we have gathered about my house, that it's dirty. Surprise. Uh, and then I would uh, launch a, a robot to clean it. Huh? I, I could use it, honestly. So basically, the aim that we have is that we spend time on the things that we all have to do. Maybe we don't like it. And then we have more time for the things that we actually enjoy. And then the things that we enjoy also take up the resources from the network because these are all those VR games and movies and the new uh, experiences that I can go to Mount Everest in my after lunch time. Okay. All nice. I think now is the time uh, where I ask for your utmost attention and that you gather all your intellectual forces because this is where we are approaching the how part. So now it was entertainment. I was talking to you about some use cases and uh, oh, maybe we will have these services in the future. But now we need to uh, dig deeper into the requirements for those use cases and then the solving technology building blocks. Yeah, so gear up. This is how we can structure the use cases, the enhanced mobile broadband. Mobile broadband is basically what we do with our networks right now. And uh, by enhancing it, we are providing even higher data rates, and sometimes we are delivering high data rates with uh, low latency, like for the virtual and augmented reality. So this is one. Then we have the massive machine time type connectivity. This is the Internet of Things. This is where we have this multitude of things enabled digitally and uh, also connected, right? And then the last uh, section here is the ultra-reliable low latency. You have the, see this icon of a robotic arm here, and this really is about the uh, connected factories or remotely controlled devices, robot telesurgery, connected cars, and this is all the things where we are after reliability and low latency. So these are the numbers that we are after. So in the topmost part, we are after higher traffic volumes in our networks, higher data rates. But this part here, 100 megabits per second, wherever needed, is particularly challenging. But I would like to get 100 megabits per second on my uh, device. So let's work towards this goal. 
And then in here, we have really have multitude of devices in uh, each square kilometer. And the challenge is how to connect all them at the same time. And actually, maybe we don't need to connect all them at the same time. We just need to have means to access them if we need to. Yeah? Then they need to be very low cost. They need to run a long time on a battery. Maybe not always, maybe not all of them. But yes, they do need to uh, run for a long time on a battery. And in here, we have the ultra-reliable low latency. So, surprise, low latency, very high reliability. So very low chance that uh, the communications that we want to uh, go through will actually get there. So the, uh, will will get lost. Yeah? And then mm, uh, the zero mobility interruption. This is particularly relevant for the connected cars or uh, self cars, if we uh, are coordinating the cars uh, from the cloud, edge cloud, we don't want to lose touch with them uh, during the handover. Yeah? So I would say pretty important. So now we only have, uh, uh, I think, two slides to go. This is one of them and I will spend uh, most of my remaining time on this one. Okay, I, three slides, because I also have a thank you slide. But this is where I will tell you about the eight domains for the new digital reality. So this is the most technical slide that I have for you. It's not too technical, but really I ask for your utmost attention and all the forces that you have left. So let's go. First. What we need is we need to have a very, very high bandwidth to the uh, edge of the network, to the uh, devices, uh, the, the sensors, but also uh, all the tablets, computers, and all the uh, edge uh, user devices. And uh, this should be realized independently of the spectrum. This can be licensed spectrum, unlicensed spectrum, mixture of that. This can uh, be in different frequency bands because also multi-connectivity is very important uh, to realize the massive scale access. So this is the first uh, item that we need to make the future X network come true. The second one, I think, uh, for me personally, it's the most important, even though I am rather a, a, a um, wireless communications person. The Edge Cloud is the main enabler for all the low latency use cases, because we need to uh, host some content, network functions, uh, close to the edge of the network in order to achieve the low latency. And as said, uh, in the next speech after this one, uh, my colleague Patrick will uh, deliver a speech on the, uh, on the mobile edge cloud. The smart network fabric, okay, this is where you may uh, wonder, okay, why would we have fabric in the network? But we actually have it, have it even now, it's, uh, it's just getting getting smart. So what this is about? This is about uh, dynamically reconfigurable connections in basically all the, all the segments that we need to go through uh, in the access, IP, metro, and core. In all those, we want to have the possibility to dynamically reconfigure the connections. Yeah, so we uh, are getting there. And actually, uh, this is very important uh, for different services. We may have different paths uh, for different services. We may have different anchor points for uh, uh, some events in the network. We may need to uh, have uh, a rapid uh, uh, rerouting uh, uh, needed. So uh, this is very important that we are able to reconfigure the network on the fly just as we need it. Actually, all of the eight things that I would show you in this slide are instrumental for achieving this future X network vision. So the fourth one is the universal adaptive core. And this means that we don't need to and we don't want to have a, a separate 
core network for uh, different networks that an operator may be running. So somebody may own a wireless network, wide area, or a, um, an, a set of uh, Wi-Fi access points, maybe some fixed lines. And what we uh, are after and what we actually are working towards is that the core network is universal and the functions that uh, we have uh, will be common for all those. Yeah? So we won't have a different session management, uh, a, a, different, uh, a different session for somebody who starts over a mobile phone uh, and then uh, gets home and switches to, to, to Wi-Fi. Right, or or maybe even then connect to fixed uh, line if this was a computer. So this is how uh, we are also trying to make life easier for people who own very complex uh, uh, networks. Number five is the programmable network operating system. What is that? So it's it does mostly the same thing that operating systems do anyway. Yeah. So this uh, uh, does for the network what uh, uh, Windows or Linux or Android or iOS do for the hardware. It abstracts all the details that are below, enables us to manage the equipment from a higher layer, and also enables a very easy launch of new services on top of the operating system. Uh, this. Uh, multiple operating systems that we see here uh, is uh, designed for the network federation and this is uh, needed if we have different players in similar or different geographical area. Number six, this is exactly where we are doing for the network, what we are also doing for all other industries. This is where we transform data into knowledge. I told you that we do this for the factories or the farm or whatever, but we also need to do this uh, for the network that we are running and that is enabling all the other use cases. We are having lots and lots of data from our network and then, and then uh, we are analyzing it, spotting uh, maybe someone is attacking our network, we are spotting maybe something is malfunctioning, and with uh, analysis we can uh, actually identify the threat easily. The digital value platforms is actually how we benefit from all the other things, from the huge network that we have built. So digital value platforms is how you deliver the uh, end, uh, how you provide the end customer with the service. Uh, this uh, can be easily launched on top of the network operating system. And uh, one example, of course, is uh, the video streaming. Uh, and uh, uh, other examples is this predictive healthcare. The predictive healthcare system can be launched over the whole network, and uh, we can have players in it like people who just own health sensors, but also hospitals can be a player. Doctors in the hospitals can, uh, in real time, track the um, track the uh, health and well-being of the patients. Uh, but also the national uh, insurance insurance system can be a player. Because what we can have is that people will just get a discount on their health insurance if they are consciously monitoring their health. Yeah? This makes sense because uh, then the overall cost per patient per, uh, per country is, uh, is lower in the end yeah? if people spot problems with their health early enough. This is a very, very important area and the security has to be adaptable. We cannot just rely on the endpoint uh, security or perimeter-based security. We need to have multiple ways to spot threats, and we have them, and we need to also have multiple ways to react to them. So maybe sometimes we block the threat, maybe sometimes we cut it off uh, our network, but maybe sometimes we contain it so that it doesn't affect other parts of the network, but then allow it to run for some time so that we can identify the attacker. Right? So different methods to react to security threats are also enabled by the edge cloud. So some 
threats can be handled in the edge cloud. And then if uh, the threat is more systematic, this can be handled more, more globally. Yes, congratulations. You have endured through the eighth digital domains for the new digital reality. So now, let me go over them. First, we are accessing the network. Then, in the converged cloud, we can have some of our services. We can have uh, some of our network functions. Smart network fabric ensures that uh, our uh, routing is properly configured and can be reconfigured on the fly if needed. The universal adaptive core makes sure that we uh, don't have redundant network functions in the core. The programmable network operating system abstracts many of the below layers so that we can launch uh, services on top of the networks easily. Augmented cognition system uh, allow us to uh, more consciously manage our networks. Digital value platforms provide value for our customers and ourselves, if I was the mobile network operator. And the dynamic data security makes sure that uh, all the things that we do uh, are secure and people can trust us. In the middle of the uh, uh, you can you see the uh, use cases for the future that are relatively close uh, or even there. Yeah. So we have smart watches. Okay, I don't have a smart watch, but I just like my watch. But people have smart watches. People uh, have uh, the tracking, an inventory system with RFIDs maybe now. So the use cases here are already there. Then the further away from the center, we have more advanced use cases. Yeah? So uh, the real-time remote control is possible to some degree, but we would like it to be better. Uh, virtual 3D presence, also relatively advanced. Thank you. I did not expect that. <laughs> we've seen the areas that 5G will cover, and we've seen that we hit the physical limit. Isn't that sad that there is nothing beyond 5G unless there is some another dimension in this plot? What do you think will be next? Will we expect like 5 and something G, 6G in the future? Yes, of course. But so we won't that be just a um, marketing blah blah? Well, I think that uh, we will know this when we reach the limits of 5G. Yeah? So there are, there are some people who say that 5G is the last system. Yeah? So I think that this uh, is a compelling thought, but after knowing the history, we have always uh, seen that a system was reaching uh, its limit at some point. Yeah? So I would speculate, but now this is a personal opinion, that 5G would also reach its limits. What we are trying to do with 5G is we are trying to design it in a way that it, an, it can accommodate even also the future use cases, yeah? So that it is flexible enough to also accommodate things that we have not thought about now, yeah? So if we are successful with that, then maybe 5G will last for a very long time, but I'm not expecting like the end of the world in 20 years from now, so I think we will have 6G. Thank you all for coming, thank you for staying, for asking, and uh, I wish you a great conference. Thanks. Thank you.